Right, so I'd now like to introduce the, the chair of, of PERN, the Pediatric Emergency Research Networks, but we'll be talking on uh, the, the impact of implementation in PREDICT. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks, Damien. Um, yesterday, I introduced the concept that if we're going to move the dial in acute pediatric care, we need to do more than just create new knowledge. We actually need to translate that knowledge into everyday clinical practice. And that has to be the ultimate goal for what we do in our research and also for the care of the patients that we look after as well. So we've realised this and moving from what Ed was talking about with all the new knowledge around bronchiolitis and we'll be doing the same thing with what Natalie's been talking about as well. It's about getting that new knowledge into everyday clinical practice. So I'm going to talk about this with the idea of guidelines. Are they a panacea for this or really just a placebo? and focus very much on bronchiolitis. And as I reminded you yesterday, it's the most common reason for children in the developed world to be admitted into hospital. But unfortunately, we're not very good at managing it. So 30% of patients internationally get treatment in the ED for which there is good quality evidence that that treatment is crap. But we need to think a little bit more than just the emergency department because we all manage bronchiolitis differently. In some hospitals, they come into the emergency department, they um, get decided to be admitted into hospital, and then our beds are blocked. So they stay in the emergency department for 24 hours. In other hospitals, they never come to the emergency department. They actually go to the paediatric assessment unit and are seen there and then admitted into the paediatric wards. So we need to look at a total hospital approach to care with bronchiolitis. And this is what this data is. It's data from over 6,000 patients from 13 hospitals in Australia and New Zealand. And each hospital is giving four years' worth of data. And what this is looking at is compliance in the first 24 hours, whether you're in the emergency department or whether you were in the paediatric ward with the international guidelines. And none of our hospitals got higher than 80%. And actually, the compliance in some of the hospitals was down as low as 20%. And these are all good hospitals. These are all hospitals where I would be very happy taking my children. So a guideline's the answer to improving this variation that we have. And I think before we talk about guidelines, it's important to get a definition for guidelines right. And I particularly like this one from the Institute of Medicine. It's about recommendations that are based on a systematic review of the evidence, looking at the benefits and harms. So that's not quite what used to happen in my hospital with our bronchiolitis guidelines. What happened with our bronchiolitis guidelines is that a couple of very handsome physicians um, got together and they may have looked at the literature, they wrote a guideline, and they wrote a guideline so that our registrars and our SHOs did what we wanted them to do at 3 o'clock in the morning so I didn't get woken up. And then they send it to their friends for comment. And their friends get 200 emails a day and they may or may not have responded to that. And then finally that gets published on our website. And that's great because our registrars do what they, we want them to do and they don't wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's important. But then what happens is one state in Australia writes their guideline for the whole state. And they have three references. One of them is the Starship Guideline. So this whole process is non-transparent. There's been no systematic review of the literature behind it. The recommendations don't indicate the strength of the evidence behind them either. It's not multidisciplinary. There's never been any meaningful consultation. And there's questionable relevance 
for those guidelines that have been created in Starship outside of me not waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning. But we don't have the time in our own individual silos to do this work to the highest standard. And we realise this and predict. And so what we did is we created the first binational guideline in acute paediatrics. And we picked the topic specifically as bronchiolitis because that's the most common thing we saw. We got over 20 individuals across medical disciplines, across both medicine and nursing, across the states and territories and the two countries as well. They looked at over 12,000 articles looking at over 30 PICO questions. And then they developed this guideline. We sent it out for very wide consultation with all the tertiary children's hospitals and with all the colleges. We wrote a 30-page response to that um, consultation. And what's been really nice is now all tertiary children's hospitals in Australia and New Zealand use this guideline as the basis for their bronchiolitis guideline. And what does it show? It shows don't use salbutamol, don't use adrenaline, don't use glucocorticoids, don't use antibiotics, don't do a chest X-ray in bronchiolitis. And that's no different than what NICE says, it's no different than what the Choosing Wisely and the North American guidelines say as well. And so with bronchiolitis, we're left with supporting their respiration, and as it is um, talked about, using high flow as a rescue device, and supporting their hydration. And you note that the little baby there has an NG tube in. But how do we go about improving this variation that exists? A guideline's going to be the answer to this. The field of medicine that really looks at this is this new field of knowledge translation or implementation science. And I look at this quite simply. It's about bridging that gap between what is known and what we currently do. So how did we go about doing this in PREDICT? Well, we're a research organisation, so we did a study. And this is new data that I'm going to show you from that study. The aim of the study was to determine whether tailored theory-informed knowledge translation, and I'll explain what that all means, versus passive guideline dissemination improves compliance with those five things that I was talking about. It was a multi-center cluster randomized control trial. It compared tailored theory-informed knowledge translation versus passive dissemination. So putting it on the website, emailing it out to your mates, what you usually do when you get a new guideline in your institution. The knowledge translation interventions, we designed them after doing a qualitative study where we went to the paediatric wards, where we went to the emergency departments, where we talked to doctors, we talked to nurses, we talked to senior staff, we talked to junior staff to say, why do you do the things that you do? Why have we got this variation that we've got? And on the basis of that, we put it into something known as the theoretical domains framework to get a package of knowledge translation interventions in order to address those reasons why people were doing the things that they were doing. So there's a lot of clever people, a lot more clever than me, who thought about the psychology behind why we do what we do. The study involved um, 26 sites, and they were mainly secondary sites. Only six of the sites were tertiary children's hospitals. In order to be a site, you needed to see 135 cases of bronchiolitis per year, be willing to be either a control or intervention site. We signed up the clinical directors for consent, and we really excluded sites where they couldn't audit their notes and where they are adverse to being randomised to being a control site. The primary outcome for the study was what sites did for individual patients in terms of their compliance or non-compliance with the guideline for those five key things 
for the first 24 hours of their patient's care, whether that be two hours if the patient just presented to the emergency department or if that was the first 24 hours for a patient who stayed in hospital for a week. And for the secondary outcomes, we looked at the overall admission into hospital. Who was to blame? Was it the emergency department or was it the general paediatric ward? And what happened in terms of length of stay, ICU and death in terms of sort of safety outcomes? The data extraction that we used for the study was retrospective, and we needed to do that to avoid a Hawthorne effect in the control sites. So if we collected data in the control sites about how you manage bronchiolitis as all those patients came through, we thought, actually, they'd probably manage it a little bit better than what they usually do. And so we took patients less than a year who had an ED and a discharge diagnosis of bronchiolitis. And what we did is we collected data for four years. The three years before we undertook the study and then the study intervention year, which was the 2017 bronchiolitis season. We did all the usual statistics wizardry and we had 90% power to address the question. So what did we actually do with the sites? This is what happened. We went to all the sites at the beginning and we talked about the study, we sorted out all their local governance, we signed them up to being part of the study and we then randomised them. In both the control and the intervention arms, we gave them the bronchiolitis guideline for them to do what they usually do with um, guidelines that they receive. For the intervention sites, we then went back and had a stakeholder meeting where we created more buy-in. We identified four clinical leads, and we got the sites to do this. So a nurse and a doctor in both the general paediatric unit and the ED department, recognising that this is a pan-hospital approach that we needed to do. We took all those people to Melbourne for a day and we, tr and we talked about bronchiolitis. And for some of the hospitals, this is the first time that actually the emergency department in the general paediatric ward had sat down for that amount of time to actually talk to each other. And we provided them the materials and how we thought they needed to use those materials as well. So there were educational PowerPoints, there were videos that were modelling ideal behaviour in terms of explaining the diagnosis that they could use. There were fact sheets, posters, we had information for families, for sites that didn't previously had that. We then got them to kind of compete against each other as well. So there was a monthly audit and feedback where they could see how they were performing, how well their emergency department was performing and their paediatric unit was performing and how well they were performing against the other 12 sites. And we supported the leads throughout the year of the study. For the control sites, we delivered them all that material at the end of the study as well, so that they didn't miss out. At the end of the study, we then collected the data. So this is what happened. We randomised 26 sites, so 13 to each group, and surprisingly, they did what we asked them to do. So none of the control sites actually did other um, knowledge translation interventions, and surprisingly, all of the intervention sites did what we asked them to do. We collected data at baseline and there was no difference in the compliance between those two groups. We then collected data for the intervention year and we had over 1,800 patients in each arm of the study. And those patients looked like our usual patients with bronchiolitis. They had a mean age of six months, just over a third of them um, were female. We had good numbers of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders, Maori and Pacific, who carry a big burden of bronchiolitis in both our countries. On this slide, you're seeing the primary outcome for the study, which is compliance in the first 24 hours with regards to chest X-ray, salbutamol, glucocorticoids, antibiotics, and adrenaline. And we saw a 14% improvement in those things in that intervention year. And that improvement was in the emergency department and was also in 
the inpatient units as well. And that improvement was across all five things. And not surprisingly, the things that people were doing worse to begin with was where we saw the biggest improvement. So in chest X-ray and in salbutamol. There was no difference in length of stay. There was no difference in death or ICU admission either. So there's some limitations to this work. We weren't able to blind staff. The data were collected retrospectively, and I've talked about the reason that we needed to do that. The participants needed to have both an ED and a discharge diagnosis of bronchiolitis. So that means that our true compliance is actually likely to be lower than what we report in the study. Because if you came into the emergency department with bronchiolitis, but then someone gives you antibiotics as you go home, and you then get labelled as bronchopneumonia, you never actually entered into our study. And the key thing is about sustainability. So we showed this improvement of 14%, but is it actually sustainable over time. So I want to go back to my question. Are guidelines a panacea or a placebo? I don't think they're a placebo. By producing the guidelines, if we look at those control sites, we improved compliance from 61% up to 73%. And that was just with local dissemination that was happening at the time. But guidelines certainly are not a panacea either. We were able to improve compliance by 14% in absolute terms by having a really specific knowledge translation plan and intervention around those guidelines. So what's next for PREDICT? So we've done a lot of work within the network on head injury. And really, for us, this is probably going to be the key area that we're going to look at next in terms of guideline work. So this data shows you um, what happens in terms of a CT rate and length of stay um, for 30 hospitals across the PREDICT network. And the hospitals are grouped as tertiary, secondary, or regional rural sites. And what you can see is there's a massive variability in our CT scanning rates of seven times across all sites. And it doesn't seem to matter what type of hospital you are. There's a massive variation in our <coughs> length of stay as well. So it seems to be worth the effort to undertake a guideline looking at paediatric head injury, talking about who we should scan, talking about what we should do for concussion and what we should do for follow-up of those patients. So in conclusion, if we're going to do guideline work, I think it needs to be high quality, but it needs to be worth the effort. So we're not going to create guidelines on every single aspect of care that we have in acute paediatrics. But we should be able to create robust guidelines for things that we see all the time. And guidelines can certainly improve care. We have evidence for that now from Australia and New Zealand of what actually happens. But if you want to maximise that improvement, you really need to have a good knowledge translation plan and interventions around that. And moving forward, I think that's going to be the major challenge for all of us. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Stuart. And a, a really good demonstration of how important studies take time because you've got a three-year lead-in period. But if you don't put that work in, you can't get to the conclusions that these guys have got. Um, any questions? No. You could, no? Uh, questions from the floor? Uh, there we go. Oh, there's Tessa just behind you as well. Oh, oh actually, then we do when that's finished. So, uh, 
That was a really good talk. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so I had a conversation at dinner last night with a, a group of consultants who I work with, uh, which was exactly around what you've been discussing. Um, and the, the split of, of, of opinion about bronchiolitis management was, was actually really enlightening for me as a, as a trainee ACP. <laughs> um, so my question is how when one consultant, emergency physician, experienced uh, consultant, emergency physician says, no, I like giving Atrovent uh, when I want to, when I feel it's necessary, and another one says, but the evidence base says exactly what you've just been discussing. How do you, uh, as uh, someone learning in clinical practice, sort of measure what you need to do in terms of your practice in the future? Yeah, look, look that, that's, that's incredibly important. And um, I think, you know, the first thing is, it's no different from our part of the world as well. So when we did that qualitative study, when we went and asked people and said, well, why do you do the things that you say? You know, a lot of the feedback we got was say, well, consultant X says do this and consultant Y says do that. So I know that when they're on, I do this and when they're on, I do that. And that way my life is simple and it's all good. Um, so we knew what the evidence showed us before we did that guideline work. We knew, you know, there was nothing revolutionary out of what we did. But what we needed to do in order to change practice was actually kind of do that local guideline process where I can stand up and say, 20 people looked at 12,000 articles, have read all the evidence, we've put it out for consultation to all the tertiary children's hospitals um, in the area, and we all agree this is what the evidence says. And so, therefore, that's part of empowering the junior staff. And that was some of the things that we did in terms of the knowledge translation program to deal with consultant X or Y, um, that you need to challenge their opinion and say, well, look, actually, there's a local guideline that says, you know, we need to do this, and this is what the evidence shows. And we had kind of two-page handouts discussing the evidence that, you know, members of the team could then go and send to, you know, those clinical leads could go and then send to the problem individuals to change their behaviour. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. As, as one of the consultants who may have been on one side of that uh, debate, um, what's really interesting to me is that uh, you may think that you are practising in the same way as your consultant colleagues, and it is worth finding out what they do. We often don't work together, um, and so you may not know that there are differences that are apparent, and I think we need to work harder at those communications. I can't remember who said it about the, uh, the consultant meeting, uh, or your ACP meeting, or your nursing meeting. That's where implementation happens. <laughs> it's not really going to be at the guideline. These are where the big decisions uh, are made. I think we had another question at the back, yeah. Hi, thanks for a great talk, Stuart. I was just wondering if you thought there's any role for this kind of knowledge translation intervention in primary care? given that's the first point of contact for a lot of acute paediatrics in some places? Oh, there's a massive role for that, for that in primary care. We specifically made the decision not to involve um, primary care in what we were doing, simply because it was just bigger than Ben Hur and, and just too hard to do, because you would need to have really good GP representation across all those states and territories, the, you know, the GP nurses as well, in order to do that. We thought what we'd do is get our own house in order first, and then sort of say, well, this is what we've done, and then move out there. We, with the guideline though, we did go to the primary care um, colleges and the primary care networks and actually get their endorsement of the guideline as well. So it's filtered down um, through their networks as this is the standard of care for bronchiolitis in Australia and New Zealand. Fantastic. Right, we've got so there's a, some two questions here and I think we've got one on Twitter as well. Let's start over there. Thank you. Mine's a follow-on question to that, but the other end of the spectrum, um, particularly the kids who then get admitted to ICU, you often see that they get thrown everything, you know, antibiotics, um, steroids, um, salbutamol, and, and then that has a trickle-on effect for the junior staff who see that being played out. And I just wanted to know, is there something different about this patient cohort and, and what your thoughts are on including them? There, there's absolutely nothing different about that patient cohort. The problem is, all the randomised controlled trials that exist in bronchiolitis, their first exclusion criteria is anyone who's severely unwell. There really is a lack of evidence 
in really the intensive care end of bronchiolitis management in terms of what we should do. There's a current study that's happening in Australia and New Zealand at the moment looking at um, adrenaline and dexamethasone as a randomised control trial. But the evidence that comes out of ICU is really weak observational evidence. So if you look at high flow, the evidence that came out of the ICUs said that um, you know, we introduced high flow to our unit. We looked historically at how many children we intubated, and we intubated around 30%. And then um, a few years after high flow, we then looked at it, and it was less than 10 and if you believe that data, you would say, fantastic, high flow was the best thing since sliced bread. But then when they did the first randomised control trial of that Ed talked about, the Malisi study from France, of high flow versus CPAP in um, ICU, high flow did worse. So, you know, it shows why we need to do randomised control trials and why we don't um, need to believe observational evidence. But, you know, that's the problem with ICU. So the way we've kind of structured that is exactly that, saying that the evidence base is weaker, there are only about 2% of the patients, and so therefore, you know, it's more acceptable to try more things in that patient population. But for the general patient who comes in with moderate bronchiolitis, there's really good evidence base that those things don't work. And that seemed to be effective. Fantastic. So we had a question over here, I think. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, so when I was a junior, when I was in med school, I was so busy trying to learn everything that evidence-based medicine was sort of the very bottom of my list other than understanding it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder that once somebody's learned something once, then changing their mind is significantly harder. So do we think there's a way where we should be getting the latest evidence into med school earlier? Whereas I see sometimes brand new qualified doctors giving me things that have been out of date for five or six years. And I think they'd be more up to date than me. In, in a tongue-in-cheek tongue way, I've always argued, actually, you go to medical school, it'd be much better to learn all the clinical stuff much later and at the very beginning embed you with evidence-based practice, compassion, all the other stuff that you need as a doctor. You've got the rest of your life to learn how to listen to a heart, that the core stuff at the beginning about understanding variation would be, would be key. Stuart? Yeah, look, I, 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 th I think you're right. Um, and it's a problem. It's a really difficult to turn things off. You know, if we had been doing that as a new intervention, and, you know, look at high flow and bronchiolitis as an example. Actually, there was no evidence base, and it was being used massively um, in all our units. Um, yet for something that we're trying to turn off, like all this treatment, that's a lot more difficult and takes a lot more effort in order to, in order to do that. So I, I, th I think you're, you're right, you know. We... To change that takes a big amount of effort. The other thing is, is that I think our understanding of medical knowledge, and you know, we know that the half-life is about five years for you know, what's up-to-date practice and things like that, and that moves, and we fluctuate between something working and having some evidence that it works, and then evidence that it doesn't work. And so because of that, you know, we do have to move with the times, and that's a problem that I think we're going to face for all our clinical practice. The political quote is that uh, the, the effort required to remove bullshit is ten times the effort required to say it in the first place. And that's a challenge. Do we have a um, question? We do, and you've generated a, uh, quite a bit of chat here. The importance of investing in knowledge translation seems to be quite apparent, and the idea of saving yourself some headaches um, with knowledge translation um, posted here by Giles, complete with a meme that has some serious head bagging going on. Um, and the importance of, um, it takes a team to uh, roll out knowledge translation. It's not just putting it there, it takes a team and some effort. We do have some questions too, and thanks, Mikey Fo or Mickey Fo Foster. Um, Stuart, this question's in two parts, so I'll give them both to you at once, or you want them one at a time? Two, two at once. Hit them at once, yeah. okay. <laughs> so question number one is, um, given, Stuart, the, the fast rate of new knowledge creation, how do we keep up with providing a tailored knowledge translation plan for each bit of new evidence? That's part one. 
And part two, could future studies look at which part of the intervention is most effective in increasing knowledge translation? Okay, so um, number one, I think the knowledge translation strategy needs to be appropriate for what you're trying to do and what you're trying to get into practice. So, for example, with the concept study that we were talking about yesterday of levetiracetam um, in status epilepticus, where we wanted to use that and incorporate that into our guidelines, we very quickly incorporated that into our guidelines by putting it in the Starship um, guideline, by putting it in the RCH guideline, and by putting it in our local APLS teaching and actually for that new knowledge that knowledge plan is going to be enough to actually get that right for the vast majority of patients and so it's a relatively easy thing to do whereas something like bronchiolitis needed that very nuanced knowledge translation plan and a massive amount of effort to actually get that and to change practice. So I, I think you've got to do the right thing for the right condition. In terms of what works in terms of those strategies, I think we all have um, various ideas in terms of what works. I think the competition helped. I think the getting the team and having a pan-hospital approach. So realising that it's not just the emergency department and it's not just the paediatric ward, but actually getting those people to talk together and actually re realising it's not just the doctors, it's the nurses as, as well, and involving all the team and getting all that buy-in was really important in order, in order to do that. But what we're doing now is doing some qualitative work and some quantitative work, kind of pulling all that out so we can work out which of the things that actually worked in our trial and had the most effect, but we don't know that answer yet. Uh, so one more question. Oh, oh we've got to, uh, who's click? Go at the back and then I'll come forward and then we'll probably close. Thanks. Um, I just wonder if you make a comment on variation in practice. It was, is it good or bad? So we're, the background to that is our hospital is undergoing an accreditation this year and one thing we're getting asked is, have you got ways to monitor variation in practice with the implication being that you've got ways to eliminate it, that children come in and they should receive standardised care. Um, I understand that for things like if you're getting your tonsils out, if you come to get your tonsils out, there should be standardised things for everybody. In acute medicine, there seems to be... We've talked a lot at this conference about um, relying on um, people's gestalt and the ability to treat every patient differently. So we've got a variance, which is good because we're offering tailored care, and then we've got guidelines which um, are making sure everyone's doing the same thing based on the evidence. Like, which one should we do? Like, well, there's a tension between those two things, and I'm interested in your comments. Look, I, I think variation practice is incredibly important. Um, I think, you know, when we look at the patients that we treat, you know, the vast majority of work that we do is in that clinical uncertainty. We're actually, we don't quite have a good enough evidence base in order to um, do the right thing for that patient. And so we need to um, guess what's right and go with that. And, but for things like bronchiolitis, um, for things like scanning for um, CT heads, actually we've got quite good evidence now for what we should do. So in those conditions we should have less variation. Uh, I think in terms of you know, training and things like that, I think it's really good. I think people should go to different hospitals as part of their training because they should see that there's different ways to skin a cat and actually you get the same result at the end of that. And that's really important to understand kind of the nuances of where we work and at the kind of part of medicine where we work as well. Thanks, Stuart. I think one final question, just for the fun. Just the reason possibly why bronchiolitis is very difficult is telling a bunch of doctors who love doing things to do less, and in some cases to do nothing, is more difficult to implement than telling us to use a fancy new piece of technology or a new drug. So I wonder if that's possibly why it's far more difficult to wrap it home. I think that's the hardest thing for us to do in medicine, is to do absolutely nothing. You're right. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your questions. And thank you very much to our speakers this morning.